From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to China's new productivity driver, Global Opportunities Unveiled, a special edition of The Hub on CGTN and Wang Guan in Beijing. With the launch of the Invest in China Summit 2024 and the emergence of new quality productive forces, China is signaling its commitment to a robust investment environment and high quality development. What does China's focus on new productivity bring to foreign businesses in China and also to the global industry landscape? And with the rise of AI, 5G, industrial internet and big data, what are the new and potential challenges and opportunities for global businesses? Now to discuss all these issues and beyond, I'm very pleased to be joined at this hour in our studio today by Zhou Aiming, Deputy Country Director at ADB, People's Republic of China Resident Mission. Also, we have with us Benedict Sobotka, CEO of Eurasian Resources Group, and also co-chair of Global Battery Alliance. Last but not least, we have Madame Liu Songling, General Manager and Chief Representative for Greater China for RGF Environmental Group. Very warm welcome to all of you. I know it's a very busy afternoon. You guys just attended the uh, CMG China Media Group Forum. I want to start by asking you um, about your takeaway from this forum. What happened at this forum? What's your biggest takeaway? I will feel overall Chinese, China uh, investment climate is very dynamic. It also brings a lot of opportunities for many industries. We have been in China for 14 years and we are very, very impressive by the world have been changed for the 14 years. Also in China, we feel government is very supportive. And uh, for example, last year, we renew our business license only take uh, one day. Mm. And uh, however, we took uh, nearly a few months for you know notarize the documents in the essay. Yeah, it's very good. It's <laughs> so always it's good very, to have very uh, you know, the procedure streamlined and yeah. the bureaucracy and red yeah. tape cut. Uh, a very uh, irrelevant question that is on the mind of very many global investors. That is, is China still an investable country? Because there are so many theories out there, um, you know, so many narratives suggesting that foreign businesses, especially Western businesses, are pulling back their operations from China. Benedict, what do you think? This summit here today, Invest in China Summit, I think is a great opportunity to talk about this exact question is, is how is China going to find its future place in the global investment? That's a very valid question and it's probably never been more acute than today because as you rightly said, there's a lot of conversation in the global business community. What role does China as a market, as a production hub, as a R&D hub, what role does it play in your global supply chain, in your global production chain. And many companies are re-evaluating that supply chain today. But it's not just about China. It is also about what role does the US play, what role does the European Union play, what role do emerging markets and other BRICS countries play for your global production and your supply chain. China has really uh, made a tremendous, um, a tremendous strive over these last uh, probably decade, um, particularly when it comes to the green energy transition. And that's been, for many uh, countries outside of China, been very surprising that the, the country that's supposed to be the most polluting, the most uh, co 2 emitting country is actually the country that is the single largest producer, deployer, investor, and innovator in green energy transition materials and green energy transition technologies. There wouldn't be an energy transition without China. Right? It's by far the largest market for solar panels, by far the largest markets for hydroelectric power stations, by far the largest markets for, for wind farms, and by far the largest markets for electric vehicles and batteries and battery storage. And I think that's a very interesting, very interesting mindset shift that is happening in the global business community today. You will not have a green energy transition without very strong participation of China. Yeah, definitely. Not so long ago, uh, J.P. Morgan Asset Management Director said, despite its economic difficulties, China should not be treated as uninvestable. Director Zhou, how would you go about looking at this issue uh, on whether or not China is becoming increasingly uninvestable or is it still a very attractive marketplace? Let me go back to 40 years ago when China just about opened up and uh, why China has such kind of high speed development because China has a lot of features other countries don't have. For example, very stable uh, political system, which is a key of driving the economic growth. So every administration of the government, they keep consistent in their policy, which means open up to the world. And uh, 
as we heard from today's dialogue. We heard about the president, she mentioned about continue to open up and the door will be even wider. So from our point of view, we fully believe China has huge potential of the market. The size matters, Very. Uh, this is number one. Secondly, if we just look at the data of 2024, the first quarter economic growth has been announced 5.0 above. And uh, this shows great strength of the economic growth and many multilateral development agencies, including IMF, is about to adjust the growth rate up. From our point of view, ADB is one of the biggest uh, regional development bank and we work with Chinese government very closely through the Ministry of Finance and DRC and under the current five year we call country partnership strategy with the Chinese government. We fully believe there are a lot of potentials for multinational uh, companies to invest in China, provide global public goods and the regional public goods, which will not just benefit the Chinese people and also the people in the region and globally. Madam Liu, we know there's a very important uh, policy meeting come up that is the third plenum of the CPC, uh, expected any time soon. Usually it is a very important platform where the senior party leaders and the Chinese leaders uh, announce the policy direction and the reform direction, uh, where, whereby this time around um, deepening reforms is expected to be a major focus, uh, rebooting the Chinese economy uh, at this very uncertain day and age. Uh, what policy direction and reform direction perhaps are you expecting from this third plenum? I'm from environmental industry. Environmental industry is heavily driven by the national policy and the industrial policy. We really wish to see that China has more you know, policy to encourage sustainable development and the focus on you know, uh, green low carbon development issues. And also we see China now focus on new quality and uh, productive force. I think at least we feel very, very optimistic. You know, Benedict, China has been accused by many Western European countries recently of exporting its overcapacity uh, in the, the green sector to the rest of the world. Maybe I can quickly get your thoughts on that before I ask you about the third plenum. The Chinese renewable energy and the Chinese uh, new energy vehicle sectors are incredibly competitive. The global demand for, for example, solar panels is actually less than the demand just in China, right? So, of course, the perception is that, that there's material that's being exported, but the fact is that it's just the competitiveness of China is just so much far advanced over many other uh, industrialized countries. And you can't just expect that your Chinese competitors will not come to your home countries. I think that's, that's a fallacy that's against any kind of Western capitalism that you can just operate uh, outside of China without actually facing Chinese competition. So there's a real opportunity if you as an international company continue to invest here because the innovation, again, uh, particularly in these energy transition relevant uh, industries, the competitiveness is here, the innovation is here. So you have to invest in China if you want to be a significant player in this space. And this is what many, many companies have done, particularly the automotive industry, what people often do not understand is the majority of the electric vehicles that are exported from China into Europe today are actually manufactured by Western OEM automotive companies. They're not Chinese manufactured, they're Chinese manufactured, but they're not Chinese companies. Those are Western companies that use a very competitive manufacturing base in China to export competitive products into other markets. Um, and that's just the natural cause of, uh, of co competitive advantage. Yeah, one key component uh, that the EV cars use, uh, that is something that you know all too well, uh, electric vehicle batteries. Uh, as far as I know, uh, in the Times, that is one of the largest um, EV battery manufacturers anywhere in the world uh, that is in southern China. And yeah. uh, it, it is all too important to have all these, uh, you know, bases. Well, that's true. And, it's, uh, and this is not just in the battery space, but is also is the level of integration. And then the manufacturing of these batteries, the innovation in those batteries, and then the recycling of those batteries, and then all the data that surrounds that. Um, and that's a good thing for the world because that drives down the price of energy storage. If you want to do a favor to the world and to reduce emissions, you have to produce yeah. cheap, competitive, yeah. renewable energy tools and renewable energy technologies. And this has yeah. to come from today, it comes from China because it is by far the most competitive. Th that should have been the case, right? That should have been the case. If you study International Trade 101, uh, Western professors would teach you 
that comparative advantage, the most beautiful things uh, in facilitating trade, driving down costs, and benefiting consumers on all sides. Uh, very and, that's, and that's true, yeah. um, if I may interrupt, it's true that the theory is like that, right? but humans do not operate in theory, right? They operate in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there will be no way for significant Chinese player in this space to avoid setting up manufacturing outside of China, right? They have to become global players because a purely export-driven business model is unsustainable for geopolitical reasons, right? So they have to invest in places mm -hmm. like Mexico and places like Germany and places like France mm -hmm. because those are the manufacturing markets mm -hmm. that will serve their regional mm. customer markets. And I think that's, in terms of global integration of the economy, that is a good thing. Just like Tesla did in Shanghai, or Volkswagen did in China uh, decades ago. Uh, very quickly, on the third plan, what are you looking at? Well, I in general, this, um, the, the broader economic goals are not just expressed in percentage, right? They are in terms of the quality of that growth and the sustainability of that growth. And that all comes through innovation and um, and new technologies. And I think that's going to be a big drive here that I would expect is, is more drive towards innovation, more drive to, uh, to investments in higher productive and higher quality type of growth. Um, and, th and that's good because China has over the last 40 years gone through 400 years of industrial developments in 40 years. Director Zhou, your company, your institution has been aligning your goals and mandates with that of the Chinese government, its development goals over the decades. So what specifics can we expect from this third plan? It should be mostly about the economy, right? That's right. So let me just uh, also share um, about what we are currently thinking. First of all, uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning, China has already reached the our up middle income country status, which means it's quite a, a developed uh, compared to other low income countries. Therefore, China must do something unique in this region. The connection between advanced economy and uh, uh, developing countries. So this is, I think, uh, China's uh, uh, position in the future. If you look at the current uh, status of, of the Chinese economy, I think uh, besides the good positive development, we also need to look at the challenges we are facing. The downturn yes. property market, and which is very critical to bring up the consumption. And I think this is the area we are working very closely with the government to provide them some high quality. Today is a new productivity uh, forces. Do you expect new and more stimulus to uh, salvage the real estate market in China? That's that's a very good question. You know, if the government has already provided combination of proactive uh, methods, one of the methods you know very well, it's a one trillion IMB special bond, and that will be drive the the fiscal uh, policy uh, very significantly. Therefore, from the property market, we really look at the third plan to come up with such kind of policy or reforms to drive the property market going up. The new quality productive forces has been in the focus. Uh, it was first of course coined by President Xi Jinping in one of his inspection tours to China's northeastern regions. Uh, it is a top policy priority, focuses on future industries and new manufacturings that has been emphasized. Um, how do you look at this concept and how do you expect that to translate into opportunities uh, for your sector? Madam Liu. For us, the uh, new quality productive force means innovation, means efficiency, means good quality. We thought this uh, new quality productive force bring us uh, a lot of opportunities and we also would like to take the chance. We thought that this is a good opportunity for us to do in China to expand our market. So since the, the you know, inception of this concept, new quality productive forces, do you see an increase of, uh, of sales to your business partners or are you positioning China market more heavily? I know that the mandate of your company is providing environmental solutions, providing fresh air, fresh water and fresh food to families, industries and societies. Yes, uh, since we have been in 14 years, now we are focused more for the opportunity for technology upgrade and uh, uh, equipment renew because now the emphasis on sustainable development and green low carbon. 
we thought our company's strategy is the aligned with this China's new development. And we feel it is a really good chance we really should take it. And a second, uh, we actively work together with our Chinese partner to make our product more localized. We thought that in China, we can have better quality and low cost. So we want to RDF inside. So we have confidence for that. We think in China, the green technology also well developed. Mm, we shared our latest concepts for environmental protection. And we also shared our expertise with the peers in this industry. So we feel like a confidence since China has such a new development. In China, we say that uh, the yi xing, like to, to live and to head out and, and to be transported from one place to another, they are you know, essentials for a good yes. life. Um, talking about which, uh, Benedict, let me turn to you. You are uh, the head of Eurasian Resources Group, you're a co-chair there, also Global Battery Alliance, um, a leader in that organization. Help us understand, um, how do you see this new quality productive forces in maybe bringing more opportunities for your company and your sector? Well, first of all, for us, uh, for Eurasian Resources Group, we're a 90,000 people um, mining and raw materials group, and China's our largest market. Right? We export cobalt, we export copper, and we've benefited greatly from the advancement that this sector has made in China over the last 10, 15 years. Um, I mean, just to put it in perspective, uh, China installed more renewable energy electricity generation capacity last year than the entire electricity generation of the African continent in one year, mm. right? Um, and that's not just for, for renewable energy, it's for electric vehicles, it's charging stations, it's uh, recycling circularity of, uh, of, of battery materials, um, and also green finance, right? The One Belt, One Road initiative, right, which we were one of the first companies to benefit from in we believe that you can replicate projects like these, green projects, across the world, similar to the, the One Belt and Road. The Green Belt and Road Initiative, I think, is, is the future. And that will be perceived as a great benefit. Um, and when we talk about geopolitics, a lot of this is perception, right? Less than 2% of the population in Europe and in the United States have ever been to China. Mm. Right? So what they know, what they understand, they have heard from someone else. Right? The, the benefits that people will see from investments from Chinese companies in their own countries, they are very tangible, mm -hmm. they are very real, you can see yeah, them. Right? And I think that's going to be a, a, a major drive for the Chinese industry and frankly also for the Chinese government to show these benefits to the world um, so the narrative is driven by the Chinese companies and not by people outside of China who have never been to China. It's always easy to demonize people that you don't see, you don't al or readily know. Think about it. it, it's pathetic and it's sad. Director Joe, let me turn to you when it comes to multilateral financing institutions. How do you see the opportunities the new quality productive forces bring to you and what kind of a transformation uh, does it really mean for the Chinese economy and beyond? From the high quality perspective, we will talk about shifting the resources from the traditional areas to the emerging areas, like uh, uh, Bandia mentioned, the green energy, green development, and also healthcare. These are very important. We come up with uh, uh, some uh, areas for the multinational corporations consideration. First of all, uh, new generation information technology, like uh, big data digitalization, which is very important for the future in China and in the region. Secondly, new material. New material decides a lot of uh, areas of the productivity. So you heard about uh, like a cobalt or, or some other new material will be very important for, for the economy's uh, consideration. Thirdly, the high-end manufacturing uh, facility. This will give you the consumer goods which leads to good life. I think this third area. And the fourth area, if we look at the Asian society, either in China, in the advanced economies, how to help the elderly, the old people, live in quality life, we can produce a lot of good services as well. So these are the areas how to make the 
new quality productive forces, translate it into better life, it put the people at the center. Director Joe, can you perhaps give us some examples and stories of how ADB's programs and projects and uh, in the financing projects um, made a difference here in China? I definitely give you a very good example because we're in Beijing and if you look at 10 years ago, Beijing's air quality was really, really bad. And ADB was called by the government together with other multilateral development agencies including World Bank, FD, etc. Working with the government together, invest in a lot of areas to reduce air, air pollution in this region, including Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei. And this program in ADB, we call it BTH, Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei program. In World Bank, they call it Jinjinji. And anyhow, by investing $2.5 billion over 10 years time period, and the air quality now, if you look at it from the uh, the, the, the high Beijing is a much big, more livable place correct. than 10 years ago. That's why. So this is really, we feel, high quality development is really put the people at the center. People must breathe, must have good quality air. And thanks for Madam Liu, you know, you <laughs> produce such kind of good quality products. It helps clean up the waterways, uh, the air outside. And uh, RGF uh, arguably is one of the leaders, uh, leading manufacturers in the world, uh, producing products to make home cleaner, you know, getting rid of mold, bacteria, Yes. Um, getting rid of what else? Harmful gases like a formal Harmful dehyde. gases in the home? Uh, yes. Which um, are ever present in our lives. Uh, yes. And uh, continue the topic uh, Mr. Zhu talked about. We feel that um, the aware public awareness for healthy and uh, green and low carbon really steadily increased. When I first come to China, they always, we always be questioned are your product good at removing the dust, mm. uh, like PM 0.5? Yes. And uh, you know, now our government really put a significant efforts. Now we have blue sky, so people also have a better living. So they now the concern the basic prob pollution problems. They care about health and green, and uh, we can see the changes from the cooperation with our partners in China. Do you see your, your company, your businesses being affected by or caught up by the China-US tensions, which has been escalating since 2014? Any products and services that are subject to uh, you know, heightened tariffs, uh, so on and so forth? For me, I'm very optimistic because I always see future, but not always see the moment. So we like China because it's really, really big market. And we thinking the difficulties we are facing, maybe everybody faces us at the same time. So also we can see that the Chinese government is actively doing some things, try to change, you know, mm -hmm. make the investment environment better. So we feel confidence. Benedict, a final question. How do you feel about the increasing, the intensifying geopolitical tensions? How do you see that impacting your businesses, of course? Yeah, well, our industry, the, the the commodities industry relies on open borders, right? Because our the, a unit of a material that we produce has to move around to different countries and through different borders until it ends up at an end customer. Um, so we, for us, it's very important that there are no barriers to trade. Um, and we've seen increasingly that that this fundamental pillar of the world economic order is being eroded. And that's a, that's a threat to business and that's a threat to, to growth. And it's also a threat to consumers who don't get the benefits of cheap products that are made, or let's say competitive products that are made in the most competitive location. Um, I mean, to give an example, um, um, a company like you, you mentioned, uh, Ningde CATL, for mm -hmm. example, which is by far the largest manufacturer of battery storage systems for electric vehicles and also for electricity generation. Um, they are also probably the most competitive company they should be exporting to other around the world and they should be setting up manufacturing centers around the world. But for them it's very complicated because there's mm. so many... De-risking. And that's very unfortunate because not everyone in the world now has access to those products that are the most competitive and very, very likely some of the most competitive in that space. Um, so for, for businesses in China, again, the, there's a, an impediment to go out and globalize. Because the Chinese market, electric vehicles is a good example, already 50% 
of cars sold in China this year will be electric. There isn't that much growth left, whereas in other countries it's 5%. The United States is about 6 or 7%, of which the majority is California. Right? So uh, the growth is outside of China in these new energy vehicles and in energy transition technology. So Chinese companies have no alternative but to go out, and they should, right? Mm. Because these geopolitical tensions, they might get worse before they get better, but over the long term they will get better, right? Because the world needs the technologies and the manufacturing prowess of the Chinese industry to decarbonize. There is no way the world will achieve the Paris goals for reducing carbon emissions without the capacity of the Chinese renewable energy industry. Yeah, exactly. Um, we had the l hardest year last year and this year uh, is widely uh, expected to be you know, uh, the hardest ever, beating the records of last year. Uh, Director Joe, any final thoughts? Yeah, actually, I would talk about this trade tension. You know, ADB, one of the mandate is about regional cooperation integration. And in this region, we proactively and also significantly support the regional cooperation, including two major mechanisms uh, our office involves. The first one called CARAC, Central Asia Regional Economic Cooperation Mechanism. By having 10 countries together, we did a lot of successful projects by supporting the cross-border trade, mainly focused on transport network and other trade facilitation. So this is one. The second successful mechanism is the Greater Megong Sub-Region Corporation. Yeah. And uh, China has two provinces, Guangxi, Yunnan, as part of the GMS uh, Corporation mechanism. And we promote the cross-border trade agreement, and again, to promote the trade among all these countries. By doing so, as we uh, uh, noted, a lot of benefits will be generated generated through corporations. So that's, that's our mandate and we are very happy to be part of this journey. Very good conversation. I want to thank all of you for being here today after taking part in the forum. Thank you very much indeed. I also want to thank our viewers. Thank you for watching this special edition of The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our news coverage continues. Bye and take care.